Yes, I'm. So my my research interest is indeed in mechani- in chronic pain, and in delineating possible new mechanisms and therefore targets for uh, treating chronic pain that is defined by clinicians as uh, pain that persists um, three months after the anxiety stimulus. It is um, it is debilitating and. Um, um, Patients are really undertreated for their chronic pain because we don't have uh, good enough analgesics or antiepidalgesic drugs, in particular for neuropathic pain, as David highlighted earlier. So, neuropathic pain is in, sort of going to be the focus of my talk. As you all know, pain starts in the periphery, um, not just stimuli received in the periphery, say the skin. Uh, then uh, converted in action potentials and transmitted uh, from this the PNS, from this periphery to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord in the CNS, and then transmitted centrally up to the cortex where pain is perceived. Neuropathy pain is um, the result of uh, injury uh, to the nervous system. For example, a peripheral nerve trauma or chemotherapy. Uh, treatment are associated with neuropathic pain. Uh, pain is spontaneous, is stimulus dependent, is characterized by uh, amplification. Two phenomena, peripheral sensitization and central sensitization. But also is marked that there's a marked immune response associated with neuropathic pain. That is the interest of my research indeed. Um, Neuropathic pain is um, maladaptive and can be extreme persistent for really many, many years in patients. Um, the vision, so that my, my lab, my research vision, the research of my group um, is, um, let's say, if we try and focus, we, we claim it that we try and focus on um, neuroimmune interactions and we find novel pathways for neuroimmune communication, we will disclose new therapeutic avenues for treating chronic pain. So in our model systems, we have, you have to consider as follows. So this is a peripheral nerve in an animal, so an injury to a peripheral nerve, nerve trauma or chemotherapy treatment that does cause a neuronal injury is associated with an increased afferent um, Barrage and incre- increase action potentials going from the periphery to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. When the, the first pain synapse is formed, this increased action, number of action potential results in increased activation of dorsal horn neurons in blue here. And then you can imagine um, not just signaling transmission, um, increased um, transmission to the brain, amplification of pain signaling and persistence of pain signaling. In this situation. In the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, this is the primary afferent terminal, this is the dorsal horn neuron. Um, under condition of persistent pain, there's an increased release of neurotransmitters, increased recruitment of uh, receptors, the, recept- the normal recruitment of receptors like for glutamate and MDA. Uh, you have to imagine this synapse, synapse in a facilitated state where any given input is then transformed by the the CNS neuron in an amplified output and increased signaling to up to the cortex and that gives an idea of the sort of chronicity of pain and amplification of pain. So what we have realized in the last 20 years in the pain community is that actually Obviously, an injury in the periphery is associated with infiltration of immune cells. See here you have my macrophages, immune cells that, that go to the site of injury. But we know that these cells release cytokines, chemokines, factors that can sensitize the sensory neurons, which express receptors for them, for interleukin 1 or TNF. Fine. But what is was also been quite fascinating is that what we have realized is that in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, when there's no injury, because the injury is remote to the dorsal horn, the immune cell of the CNS, the microglia, respond to the increased neuronal activity, which I just described, and they respond by changing their morphology, which is what we notice when we do immunistochemistry of the spinal cord. So from this small cell body with 
lung protrusion. The cells uh, are many more, and then uh, they also change morphology slightly. They, but they also release factors, like the macrophages do in the periphery. The macroglia in the spinal cord in the CNS release chemokines, uh, cytokines, factors that sensitize the first pain synapse even more than it is and maintain this sort of positive feedback, maintains excitation and um, in the end, uh, it behaviorally, maintains hyperalgesia, allodynia, chronic pain. And so we have explored, together with other laboratories, we've explored the way, the modalities for this sort of neuroimmune communication in the periphery, in the, in the spinal cord, and we have delineated new pathways that bring offer potential targets to the pharmaceutical industry for novel uh, therapies. Briefly, the models that we use in the labs, you might be familiar to them, but I thought I'd mention, because it, my talks will be clearer. In, for neuropathic pain, many laboratories throughout the world, in the pain community, we have established models. We all use and we all have a very similar data, so that reliable um, injury to a peripheral nerve. A sciatic nerve. The rats look like this. They sort of guard in behavior towards the injured uh, hind paw. And when we apply noxious stimulation, in this case, an increased pressure to the hind paw, the animals, if the un if the nerve e innervated the hind paw, so the ipsilateral paw is injured, the animal threshold for withdrawal is much lower than normal. So normally, a withdrawal pressure is a hundred gram, and in the in after injury, the withdrawal um, threshold is 60 grams or more. And this, this sort of phenomenon persists for many, many weeks. To us, this difference in thresholds is a measure of hyperalgesia. And we would like to develop drugs uh, that, oh, I mean, not we don't develop drugs, but drugs should be anti-hyperalgesic. Uh, what we would like is for uh, the drug to re for the threshold to go back to normality, we don't want another morphine. We not after analgesics that change the ability to perceive acute pain, but just thresholds return to normality. Um, I'm going to also to, to show you um, a pathway we delineated in the um, model of chemotherapy-induced pain. As you may be aware, um, any oh, chemotherapy uh, treatment or drug, drug uh, cancer treatment is associated with neuropathic pain. That is a major of side effects. If we manage, if we were able to control the, the neuropathic pain, the, the, the development of neuropathic pain, or, or just therapeutically reduce the neuropathic pain, we could be more aggressive with cancer therapy. In our lab, we use a model um, of vincristin-induced uh, neuropathic pain. So this alkaloid, which is used for neuroblastoma, when, in, when administered in animals, in this case mice, systemically is associated with drop of threshold for in pain tests. So from in this case from one gram we drop a threshold down to nearly zero. So it's severe allodynia, severe drop of threshold. This difference to us is a, a measurement of allodynia that is associated with the administration of increasing persists after the, the treatment is stopped and then the animals the allodynia recovers spontaneously. In my laboratory, we've been interested um, in particular in, in the possibility that chemokines uh, could mediate neuroimmune communication, and in particular, the chemokine fractal kind and the receptor GPCR6, 3 cr one because these two uh, chemokines are quite special. Uh, they have a one-to-one -one relationship. Well, fractal kind is the only chemokine for the 6 3 cr one set, and 6 3 cr one is the only receptor for fractal kind. This is what we know at the moment. So they have a one-to-one -one relationship, whereas most of the chemokines are promiscuous. And uh, there's another peculiarity, uh, fractal kind, the chemokine fractal kind down here, is the only transmembrane chemokine. Um, um, cells that express fractal kind um, have a, the, have the protein um, as a transmembrane protein, carboxy intracellular, mucin stalk, and the chemokine globular domain, uh, ex extracellular, hanging from cells that express the chemokine. 
um, the, the, the C X three C L one is is a uh, G P C R. They all are G P C R. They have nothing. There's nothing special about the chemokine receptors. The the fractal kind and C X three C L one in sort of my in our uh, pain system in, um, um, in the periphery. You have to consider are located as such. The, the fractal kind is endothelial, is expressed by endothelial cells, and the receptor, CX3, CX1, um, in tissue and macrophages, but also in circulating monocytes. In the CNS, there's no endothelial fractal kind. Fractal kind is neuronal derived, and this is the fractal kind. Every single yellow cell is a neuron in the dorsal bone expressing fractal kind. And the receptor, CX3, CX1, exclusively expressed by macrophilia. So in the spinal cord, the fractal kind and the c 3 c one are ideally located, say, anatomically to mediate neuroimmune communication. Um, for a number of years, my PhD and postdoc Anna Clark worked on this system in the spinal cord, and we have uh, delineated a pathway as follows. So we have a peripheral nerve injury, and we are in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, where the microglia are sort of responding to the increased neuronal activity, so they're activated. What we um, demonstrated is that um, a release, increased release of ATP from sensory neuron, but also dorsal horn neurons, activates the P2X7 receptor onto the microglia, and the uh, low affinity receptor for ATP, and results in release of a lysosomal enzyme called catepsin S which cleaves the globular domain of fractal kind, releases the, the globular domain. The fractal kind can then interact with the CX3C1 receptor onto microglia and start intracellular pathways like P38 uh, phosphorylation. Release, it uses release of mediators such as interleukin-1-beta, which then sensitize neurons that express receptors for them. This sort of complex pathway um, and establishes a, p a positive feedback. The microglia pos feeds back onto neurons and maintains activity and maintains chronicity of pain, a mechanism for chronicity of pain. But this sort of approach then um, reveals the possibility that one could uh, target the microglia with C3 C1 antagonist, P2X7 receptor antagonist, catepsin S inhibitors, P38 inhibitors. We have evidence that all of these targets contribute to hyperalgesia and allodynia. And so these molecules represent new targets for neuropathic pain, which are not neuronal. They are expressed by the microglia cell. The anti-hyperalgesic, anti-allodynic effect you observe is about 50% of reduction, not complete reduction of allodynia sort of pain, 50, 40 to 50%. In the model of incristin in chemotherapy induced pain, as I said, um, chemotherapeutic agents, they all induce a neuropathic pain. So there is an opportunity to prevent the development of neuropathic pain in models or in, in chemotherapy. And in, the, in that incristin model for chemotherapy, we delineated a pathway. This is all published work with uh, Liz, Liz All, the PhD students in my lab, supported by BDSSA, we delineate a pathway for which we, we, we demonstrate that vincristin, systemic vincristin, induces an endothelial activation, first of all. And this endothelial activation is associated with increasing adhesion molecules and increased um, uh, transmigration of monocytes in the nerve Meet this transmigration mediated by fractal kind interaction with C X three C one. Once the, the monocytes are into the nerve, the interaction of fractal kind with C X three C one results in release of, of reactive oxygen species, which in turn activate a pain channel, three pay one, expressed by um, neuronal axons that signals pain from neurons to the cord to the uh, brain where pain is perceived. So this sort of pathways provides a, a target where we say antagonists of CX3 C1 could be exploited for prevention, the prevention of neuropathic pain associated with vincristin treatment in uh, cancer chemotherapy. So these sort of studies of 
than we normally, um, as I said, um, offer potential new targets. Certainly alternatives to neuronal targets and alternatives to the opioids, where we one could target P27, P38, so and except depending on preferences, a receptor, a channel, an enzyme, a GPCR onto the microglia, expressed by microglia, to, for the control of neuropathic pain. Or in the case of chemotherapy, we propose targets expressed by monocytes, the catapsin S and the CX3, so one again. In the sort of, um, I think in the sort of last 10 minutes I have, I wanted to illustrate to you more recent work we've done as um, uh, members of this NCRNA pain uh, consortium, a European consortium supported by the European Commission, where we had clinicians, the clinical scientists devoted to try and understand whether macroRNAs have a role in chronic pain. Um, pathways, in my case, neuroimmune pathways, the clinicians have looked for possibility that macroRNAs in plasma could be biomarkers for pain. So macroRNAs are a small non-coding RNAs. Uh, there's many of them, I mean the thousands, but we had some of them are, are found along the pain pathways. These macroRNAs, I'm sure you know about them, but they are uh, 1925 nucleotides, and they um, once in the cytoplasm, they inhibit, uh, it, uh, mm, re they repress their target, the expression of their targets. Um, because they are complementary to the RNA of the target, either perfect complementarity or imperfect complementarity, but they end up inhibiting translation or um, um, promoting mRNA um, cleavage, and so they inhibit that target. We um, we we we, sh we um, decided to. Um, to look for uh, possible roles in neuropathic pain and of this microRNA twenty one. These are the cell bodies of the of the neurons uh, after the the axons have been uh, injured in the periphery in a model on neuropathic pain. And, and it's obvious here that this microRNA is up tremendously upregulated in the cell bodies of neurons after um, an axotomy after peripheral nerve injury. When we went to look for where the, which neurons in the dorsal ganglia express this macroRNA, we found it in every single um, neuron in the dorsal ganglia, all these green and red cells, large bodies, small cell bodies. So all neurons express this macroRNA. But we also observed some cells in the neurons after the peripheral nerve injury, cells that are macrophages because they are these red cells, because they are stained with a, a macrophage marker at 480. These cells had uh, some fluorescence, microRNA 21 fluorescence into them. And so we postulated that um, what was possible it was that after peripheral nerve injury, here in the periphery, in the cell bodies of the sensory neurons in the dorsal root ganglia, we had expression of microRNA 21 in the neurons, and then release of this microRNA 21 from the neurons, and then the macrophages, which we know infiltrate the neurons after a, a nerve injury, would engulf the, the microRNA, from, so mediating neuroimmune communication. So we started our work in vitro by first of all taking these neurons here, the cell bodies of these neurons, and trying to see whether they had, um, whether they could release exosomes. Reason being that uh, microRNA um, are not very stable, um, and, and so the idea is, usually the idea is that they are released in from whatever cells in small vesicles like this. They are formed intracellular. They are released after appropriate stimuli. And they have um, markers of, um, that can be used to identify their presence in a, uh, in a media, in a release media. In, inside these exosomes would uh, contain macroRNAs. When we um, isolated sensory neurons, the AG neurons in culture. Indeed, we could actually, this is um, Western blot for TSG101. These are exosoma markers. We can actually fi find exosoma markers in the media of, of control uh, sensory neurons, but also more 
um, exosome marker, so with the presence of exosomes, after we activated neurons with capsaicin, which is a noxious like stimulus in vitro. And this, this new, so increase in exosomal markers here, this G11, flotillin, MF gene, but also in the exosomal fraction of the, um, of the media, we could measure um, the presence of macroRNAs. MacroRNA 21 is the one of interest to my talk today. This effect of capsaicin um, is receptor mediated because when we use uh, DRGs from TRUP1 receptor knockout mice, we couldn't detect anymore um, by Western blot the presence of exosomal proteins and also the uh, macroRNA release completely blocked. This is the release, the MIR21, no release of MIR21 if the DRGs were obtained from TRUP1 knockout mice. The exosomes um, in the field of microparticles, you, you, this is not enough, so we had to visualize these particles. And we, we use flow cytometry. Here you see these are extracellular vesicles. And after neurons are incubated with capsaicin, you see more extracellular vesicles. In image stream, they look like this. And then they quantified. So neurons incubated with a noxious like stimulus release. Of microparticle exosomes that we, we actually measured, and because they are 40 to 100 nanomole, uh, nanometers, they uh, can be defined as uh, um, exosomes. These neuronal exosomes can be engulfed by macrophages. So if the macrophages, these red cells, are incubated with uh, exosome, fluorescent exosomes derived from neurons, they engulf the neurons. They take them up. This this green into the red cell. Phi, this is what normally macrophages would do. What is interesting is that we noticed that the macrophages engulfing neuron derived exosomes were polarized towards an M1 phenotype, pro inflammatory phenotype, using INOS as a marker, for those of you interested. So more M1 and less M2. So they take the neuronal exosomes, they are polarized towards a pro inflammatory and chronosusceptive phenotype. But is this because they take MIR-21? Indeed, when we transfected macrophages with a MIR-21 mimic, uh, we could see, we could say the same. So with a MIR-21 mimic, mimic, macrophages have more INOS protein than, P, than uh, and more P, P, uh, P, P65, and also more INOS messenger RNA and less messenger RNA for M2 markers, CD206, arginase 1, so they have less, uh, the, the MIR21 um, promotes an M1 phenotype in macrophages. And you know, that we also confirmed by using fax analysis of these uh, macrophages, if, when um, macrophages were um, uh, been transfected with MIR21 mimic, they had um, more, with more M1 phenotype and less M2 anti-inflammatory phenotype. So this in vitro data indicated to us that the noxious-like activation of sensory neurons using capsaicin results in release of small particles, particularly exosomes containing macroRNA21. That macrophages can readily uptake these exosomes, and when they actually contain MIR21, they are likely to be um, polarized towards a pronosusceptive or inflammatory phenotype. This is all done in vitro. And then I'm going to show you our in vivo evidence for a mechanism uh, that um, indicates that release from neurons, and, um, from the DRG, from the sensory neurons, um, results in macrophages taking up um, exosomes containing macroRNA21 and releasing uh, factors that contribute to uh, allodynia and hyperalgesia in under neuropathic pain conditions. I have two pieces of evidence, I lost three minutes, um, to prove in vivo relevance of this mechanism of neuroimmune communication. One is as follows. Mice were uh, treated intrathecally, so directly here in the spinal cord, with a microRNA antagonist, oligonucleotide, which is an antagonist for the, for the MIR-21. 
and uh, a treatment for seven days resulted in, in this mice developing less allodynia. The allodynia in normal mice, less allodynia in mice treated with the antagonist. Behaviorally anti nociceptive effect of a MIR21 antagonist. The dosoruganglia, after seven days treatment with the antagomer, looked like this. They had um, the, these antagomers fluorescent, so the, the dosoruganglia had taken up the antagomer, all neuronal, no other cells. We had no evidence for other cells taking up the antagomer. So the, neuro, the antagomer had gone to the neurons completely, just to the neurons. And the macrophages in the uh, that had infiltrated the DRGs in the animals treated with the antagomy were reduced in number. So less macrophage infiltration in animals treated with the antagomy, reduced allodynia and reduced macrophage infiltration. When we isolated the macrophages after treatment in vivo, we took the macrophages from the dorsal ganglia after treatment in vivo, I'll be quick here. The, the macrophages of the animals treated with antagomere were less, reduced in number, and also less M1 and more, but not significantly, more M2. So the antagomere, had, uh, the treatment of the antagomere had promoted a shift, had reduced M1 phenotype in the macrophages in vivo in the DRGs. And then, because the referee asked for it, we had to take a different approach in collaboration with the EMBL colleagues, Paul Eppenstall um, in uh, uh, Montreal, in Rome. Paul Eppenstall and his group, they, they knocked out the expression of MIR-21 conditionally just in sensory neurons. And this is proof of reduced expression of MIR-21 exclusively in sensory neurons. These animals, after an injury, develop less allodynia. Rather than here. And uh, in this case, when we isolated the, 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 the macrophages from the DRGs of the MIR21 condition of cow mice, we were able to see an increase in M2 macrophages, a decrease in M1 as with the antagonist. But in this case, we were also able to see an increase in M2 macrophages. So, indicating that this neuronal MIR21 is then able to change the polarization state of macrophages which are in the vicinity of the, of the sensory neurons. And so we, we conclude that generally, you know, general statement is this regulation of non-coding RNA in sensory neurons uh, can regulate the inflammatory infiltrate in the dorsal ganglia. And then because the pharmacologist, the idea is the proposal is that if we were able to deliver microparticles, say exosome containing microRNA antagonists, but in a tissue specific manner, um, I would say these exosomes would have to be just going to, to monocyte macrophages, not the neurons. We would have, um, let's say, we would have an innovative, a new approach for um, treating um, neuropathic pain. I have um, acknowledged the funding bodies and the people that have contributed to the work. I just wanted to stress this microRNA work has been supported by a U NCRNA um, grant from the European Commission. Uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much.